My name's Ian Court. I'm one of the wildlife conservation officers with the Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority. This video today will highlight how important areas like the Yorkshire Dales National Park are for breeding waders and how they're found on sites like this on Ingleborough National Nature Reserve. We'll give some background information on the breeding waders that there are and also look at some of the habitats and management work that benefits breeding waders and make sure that these areas maintain large important populations. The Yorkshire Dales National Park supports a variety of priority habitats and species. Many of these are upland specialists and found in areas like Inglebury that are found on the western fringes of the National Park. One of the key habitats we have in the Dales is the Inby or white ground, it's often referred, referred to as the moorland fringe. This is a really important area, it's a key habitat in its own right, but it's also a key habitat for a wide range of different species. This tends to be the area that falls between the heather moorland on the high fells and the hay meadows on the dale bottoms. These really are key habitats and they're where some of our most important species like the breeding waders, black grouse and skylark are found. We're fortunate that we still have these habitats and species in the dales and that the area supports nationally important numbers of a wide range of species including the breeding waders. This video will highlight a few of the key species and the habitats that they require and hopefully inform you more about the land management that's needed to conserve and protect this wide range of important species. One of the key breeding wader species that's found in the National Park is the curlian, the largest of all the wading birds in Europe. This is a really distinctive bird with its strikingly long down curved bill and its evocative bubbling call. We are fortunate that many of these are still found in the Dales on our moorland fringe habitats and on the slopes of Inglebury. Spring is really the best time to, to visit the Dales when you can see these birds in their full glory. They'll be doing their display flights over the meadows and pastures as they set up their breeding territories. The curlew can be found in a wide range of habitats from the moorland and fell tops on the, on the high ground, on the pastures on the slopes and down to the hay meadows in the valley bottoms. This is a species that requires a mosaic and range of different habitats uh, from rushes where the birds will nest, where there's thick cover, where the adults when they're sitting on the eggs can remain hidden from predators and offer some shelter from poor weather during the spring. Once the eggs have hatched they'll take their chicks away and move to more open ground where they need wet areas where there's plenty of insects and also less dense habitat where the chicks can move through without getting caught up and tangled in the grass and rush. It's important there's also areas of open ground, so if the chicks do get wet during the rain, they can get out into the open and dry themselves. But the, the rush also plays an important part in protecting them from predators. So if a crow or a fox is hanging around, these, these chicks can move into the areas of rush and hope to remain undetected. The curlew is one of the species that we have significant concerns about given the decline of the, the population across many areas of the country and Europe. It's estimated that we've lost around 20 to 30% of the breeding population in the last 15 to 20 years. But we still have a population of around about 59,000 pairs, and thankfully these are still holding their own in the, in the dales. These are long-lived birds, they may live up to 20 or 30 years, and they return to the same breeding sites year after year. This is why it's important that the areas where we have breeding curlew are maintained and protected and well managed to ensure that these breeding areas are maintained year after year so the curlew can continue to return to breed. When they've nested and the young have fledged, these birds will often hang around until poor weather forces them to move to some of the coastal and estuary areas around the country. Another species that favours rough grassland is the snipe and is found particularly in wetter areas where there's flushes and mires. This is a species that's very susceptible to land drainage and where agricultural improvements across the country have drained land and these wetland areas have been lost. This is one of the species that rapidly declines and disappears. It has a real cryptic plumage. It can often be very difficult to see as it hides and feeds in thick grassland. Often in winter, you'll only see it when it's inadvertently flushed when you're walking through a wet area and it will fly off given its characteristic call and zigzag flight. They can be more visible in the spring and during the breeding season. 
when often you get birds like this that are perched on a, on a fence post or a wall top as they keep a careful watch over their breeding territory. One of the most spectacular sights in the dales in, that can be seen in the early morning and evenings is the spectacular display flight of the snipe, which is known as drumming. This is where they fly over their breeding territory, making a really strange high-pitched sound. Many people think it's a call, but it's actually the air vibrating over the outer tail feathers, creating this really, really strange noise. So if you do get a chance to see one doing the display flight, do try and take a look and see if you can look out and see its tail fanned. And there you'll see with a bit of luck, you can see the outer two tail feathers that are sticking out quite noticeably to the side. And this is what causes this fantastic noise. The British population is estimated around about 67,000 pairs. And there's still good, good numbers to be found in the dales. One of the other key important breeding ways of species is the lapwing. This species is slightly different from the previous two, as they require a short sword to, to nest, compared to the curly and snipe that prefer to, to nest in longer, more rank grass. So this is a species that rather than relying on camouflage, like the snipe and the curly, to conceal itself when nesting, they like to nest it colonially in more open ground, where they can keep a sharp lookout for predators. You'll often get these species nesting in close proximity to each other, and this is a mechanism for protecting themselves against predators. So that if something like a crow does fly over, all the birds from one area can fly up to mob it and drive it away. And this is particularly why you find them in these areas of short glass grassland when they are very visible. They also have to be careful that in spring, <clears throat> the young lambs they were often found in the same pastures and meadows early in the season. And many times you'll see a young inquisitive lamb being driven away by, by a very aggressive annoyed adult lapwing. Another one of the spectacular sights in the spring is the tumbling display flight of the lapwing, as these birds weave and twist over the, over the breeding territories, showing the spectacular contrasting plumage, where it's bright white underneath and the dark green upper parts. For this species, one of the reasons for the decline can be undergrazing rather than overgrazing. So if stock are taken off to try and improve, improve sward height, and sward structure and the grass too, it becomes too long, you will lose lapwing as they prefer to nest in the really short vegetation. They do, however, need some cover and once they've successfully hatched the eggs, they'll move their chicks away to nearby areas where there's more tussocky vegetation that provides shelter. And also, like all the other species of waders, they do need wet areas so they can find invertebrates for their feeding their young. So it's another key species that requires a different bit of habitat and wet areas. The moorland fringe is also important for a wide range of other species, including the skylark. This is a species that's particularly widespread in the national park and can still be found in many areas along moorland edges and moorland fringe. A walk across Inglebury in the spring, you'll almost certainly hear skylarks singing away as they do prefer and are found in good numbers in these areas of rough grassland. They'll often do their display flights from really high up, anywhere between 50 and 100 metres, and can be often difficult to see. But after a few minutes and a bit of patience, they'll hopefully pick out a dot in the sky, which at some point will slowly descend to the ground. And once they're here, you'll often get some quite good views of them as they're running along the ground, searching for insects and, and seeds. This is a species that also requires a mixed grassland where the nests tucked away carefully in dense cover where they're well away from predators and open areas where they can bring their chicks out to feed. In a good year, this is a species may have two, three, even possibly four broods, which also helps to, to maintain and increase the population. Like many of our other species in this sort of habitat, they'll stay around and can linger into the winter if the weather's mild. But as soon as frost and particularly snow comes along, these birds will move to, to lower ground and coastal areas. Nationally, the population has undergone quite significant declines. These birds have been lost from many areas, particularly in lowland areas where there's been arable crops. But we've thankfully, in the dales where we still have lots of uh, the grassland habitat and heather moorland, these birds are still widespread and occurring in good numbers. One of the other really impressive species that you may be fortunate to come across along the moorland fringe is the black grouse. This is perhaps one of the key species of the moorland edge, as it requires a wide range of different habitats at different times of year. 
So at some times of the year, it can be found feeding on heather. But other times, it will need the meadows, the pastures, and also the scrub and woodland. Because really, this is a bird of the woodland edge that is still remaining in many areas of the dales. It's perhaps best known for its elaborate courtship displays, as you can see in the image here. This is where the males all gather at a single display site known as a lek, and they carry out this spectacular dis display. With the tails fanned, the wings drooped, and they have a loud bubbling call that can be heard from up to two kilometers away. They're most active in the first few hours of daylight, so that is the, really the best time, and there's nothing more spectacular in the dales than watching the sun rise, watching black grouse display and call over the fell side. These males will form in small numbers, possibly even to double figures in many areas, and have a hierarchy where the dominant male is in the centre and he's the one that will attract all the females and they will come in and mate before they go off and fly into the wider countryside. The females will disperse and may be seen in many different areas and will move up to 24 kilometres from the, from the licking site. The females will then fly off into the surrounding countryside, lay their eggs and bring the young upon their own. It's a species that has made a slow comeback in recent years, thanks to a lot of the management undertaken in many areas, and we're thankfully now finding these birds on a number of the moorland edges around the National Park. So these slides have hopefully shown you some of the important bird species that are present in the Yorkshire Dales National Park, including many that can be seen in and around the Ingleby area. Habitat management is key to their conservation and crucial in making sure that these populations survive in the National Park. And to do this, the landowners play a crucial role in delivering the required habitats. The following video will look at some of the habitat management that required by our breeding wave species, but also benefits a number of other species like the skylark and the black grouse. It will show how important the vegetation height is in terms of producing a mosaic of long vegetation for camouflage for birds when they're, when they're nesting or young chicks, but also more open areas where they can take the young out to feed. It's also important to remember the different grazing regimes, and this will highlight how important cattle are in delivering these targets. So here we are on the Ingleborough National Nature Reserve, looking across over towards Ingleborough. And we'll look at the type of habitats and things like the sward structure and composition that make it really good for breeding waders. So looking across here, you've got a nice flat area that ground nesting birds like waders like, because they can see any predators coming. On an area like this that's primarily calcareous grassland in the spring and summer there'll be no doubt lots of lapping on here making use of this habitat. As you can see in the background one of the other important features for breeding waders is what, what the grazers are. So here we have a herd of hardy breed cattle that are out on the moor and fell all year round and they help break up the grass and the sward structure and give it a diversity that's really good for breeding waders. So one of the main differences between grazing with cattle and sheep is the sward height that it leaves. So if you graze with sheep, they tend to eat the grass down really low, really short, and it'll be uniform across the field. But when you graze cattle like this, you can see that they, they graze it differently and they create a real mosaic of sward height. So you've got really nice short areas here close by nice tussocky areas where there's a bit more cover for invertebrates for the young and as you can see across here you get this really broken sward height which is ideal for waders and their chicks. So one of the important things for breeding waders is small little wetland areas like this. So this might not look much but from a breeding wader point of view this is absolutely perfect. In the spring and summer there'll be lots of insects flying around here, insects in the grass that are the main food source for the young chicks. And as you can see from this, it's a small wet area. If you imagine yourself being a small wader chick, the grass is fairly short in some areas. That's another benefit of the cattle being on. You can see some of the foot marks on the left that allows the chicks access to these wet areas to feed. There's also some slightly taller grass at the back that if it's bad weather or a predator flies over, they can soon scuttle off into cover and hide themselves away. So this is the ideal sort of habitat you want for breeding waders. Small areas like this spread over a large area like we've seen across the landscape of Ingleborough is the ideal feeding habitat for waders. 
So we've moved down here onto the more acidic areas where as you can see we've got a different type of vegetation growing to the calcareous limestone grassland we had slightly higher up. When you get into areas like this you'll start getting a different mix of plants, a different mix of species and therefore it's different for a number of different wading birds. So these are the areas where your vegetation is slightly taller, slightly more tussocky where you're more likely to get species like uh, curlew and snipe. So they will like some rush, so it provides a bit of cover for them. But one of the problems when you get too much rush is it just gets too thick and matted. So you imagine a small wader chick trying to get through all this, it's really going to struggle. So when areas get too wet and too much rush, you start to lose your value for breeding waders. So some areas of rush are really important for, for breeding waders, because it provides cover for the adults when they sat on eggs incubating, and also cover for the small chicks. But as we've seen from early, if we get too much rush, it's too thick, it's too dense, it's really difficult for the birds to move through. This area of rush has benefited from cattle grazing. So as we can see here, it's not as thick, it's not as dense, and it's quite open. So it's easier for the adult waders and the chicks to move through as they're looking to find food. So this is where the cattle have come in, grazed it, broken it up and provided a really open broken sward structure that is really great for breeding waders, providing cover and plenty of food. And in amongst it you can see some of the foot marks that the cattle have left. Some of these will fill up with water when it rains, they're quite good for insects and also adds the whole value and added benefit of grazing an area of cattle rather than sheep. <laughs> 